Jeannie Ives, thanks for joining us on the Onoi channel again. It's been a long time since we talked, and I think probably as I look back over the last several years, every time we talked, you were a candidate for some office. Uh, you've been a state representative, you ran for governor, and you ran for Congress. And uh, now you're doing other things, and uh, we wanted to catch up with you. And folks, we're, we're going to talk with Jeannie, not just catching up, but we're going to talk about some very important issues that are coming up before the legislature this week that are going to impact you no matter where you live in Illinois. And it's very critical that you listen to this. Uh, before we get into that, Jeannie, let's just do a quick uh, update on what it is you've been doing now because you're continuing. And now I would say you're, you're using social media to give yourself the platform so that you can continue to speak out on these issues that are so critical to the state. Uh, yes, um, thanks for the opportunity to come onto your show, Tara. I really appreciate it. So I am the co-founder now of Breakthrough Ideas. Our website is breakthrough-ideas.com. My uh, longtime friend, uh, Kathleen Murphy, and I started this. Kathleen started out as my legislative assistant in Springfield. She moved on to help with comms and, with another organization. And then she did uh, was my comms director for both the governor's race, which was a four and a half month sprint against Rauner, and then my congressional race as well. But um, so we, we looked at the congressional race afterwards and we we're like, you know, um, we just honestly believe we did not have enough money to message to everybody that needed to hear what was going on. Because from a policy point, uh, you cannot defend the Democrats policies in Illinois, in Congress, and in many cases locally, especially looking at Chicago. So we figured, figured that you know you have to got to tell people exactly what is going on and you have to do it every single day. So uh, we are a 501c4 registered nonprofit in the state of Illinois. We are a donor led initiative to bring back, uh, to bring, uh, to connect the dots to suburban voters primarily, but actually our reach is around the state and beyond, but to connect the dots on policy to voters so that we get better policy makers in office eventually because Again, uh, holding political positions is really important to determining policy. And the way that Breakthrough Ideas does this is we have a number of media items that we do, something called a Reveille, which is a two minute in and out about a policy topic. We do lighting up the media because the other thing about this is we feel like the media has is part, part to blame for the policy choices here. They do not do, give you the full story. While you, while you talk about that, Jeannie, let me bring that up. Mm -hmm. And this is from your web yeah. spot, website. And, and as you say here, let's face it, the mainstream media does not exist to give you relevant information, relevant. It exists to peddle a false narrative. In our Lighting Up the Media series, we sort out fact from fiction and give you the news that mainstream media outlets won't. Let me, let me just talk a little bit about that instead of just jumping in because mm -hmm. we want to talk about this energy bill that's coming up in the House in a minute. But first, let's just uh, go back as far as lighting up the media and where we are in the historical context of media. We used to talk that there was yellow journalism back in the 1890s. And when we talked about that, I remember first hearing that about, you know, in the 1970s. Wow, can you believe how radical and, and biased the media was back in the 1890s when we had war with Spain and the yellow journalism. My goodness, those people look like, uh, you know, Puritans of media compared to the bias in the mainstream mm -hmm. media of today. And I think, I mean, this is not some uh, paranoid idea. This uh, one of the reasons that I'm running the Illinois Channel is because I didn't want to be part of that where you, you go to work for a journalistic community and you're told that you have to do one report after another that is just one-sided and not, not covering the facts and going out of its way to be distorted distorted on what's happening in the world and being told through political correctness, you can't talk about this issue or you can't talk about that issue. I'm sure that you've run into well, this through yeah. your course of your being a candidate and trying to get your messages out. Yes, and actually lighting up the media came out of our political campaign in the congressional race. Uh, honestly, there were many times that we were interviewed by reporters 
who weren't qualified to actually ask us questions. They literally did not know anything about what they're talking about. And so consequently, when you would say something, they misinterpreted it and misreported it, and we would have to go back and correct them. So um, at, at some point, they were so biased, actually, that we refused to do the Daily Herald editorial endorsement session. We refused to do the Northwest Herald editorial in, uh, endorsement session as well, because they were such biased media. We're like, we're not going to get a fair shake anyway. So lighting up the media was a result of kind of that campaign. We had had it with the media. But what does everybody know now? Everybody now knows that the that many of the media, um, uh, you know, just flat out falsely reported things or refused to report the other side when it came to um, Fauci and masks, hydro hydroxychloroquine, uh, the Wuhan virus starting in the Wuhan lab. I mean, all this now we know from the email dump on Fauci uh, that, that the media was not playing it fair and then big tech was censoring it. So that's why that also we needed something like Breakthrough Ideas where you have your own platform, you have your own website, there's nobody that can censor it. People can go there and get our perspective on things because Kathleen and I have 10 years of watching what's been going on in the state of Illinois and even locally. And you know, it's hard to just be a startup if you don't have that policy background and, and, and able to connect the dots historically as well. So, uh, the, you know, taking on the media is very important to us. I will say this, and they will disagree, but it is true. The first thing that we found out was that the Daily Herald completely plagiarized an article from the Northwest Herald, and we caught it. We called them out on it, and the Daily Herald said, oh, it was just a, a byline mistake. No, it wasn't. And they never printed a correction. Now, if any campaign had plagiarized an entire article, you can bet that that campaign would be dead in the water. <laughs> we could do hours on the faults yeah. with media. Yeah. I would just say yeah. that uh, knowing what I know, um, you know, the problem is with journalism. And again, I, I don't want to get too deep on this because I want to get to some of the other issues in Illinois. But the problem with journalism is, number one, there there is political bias. OK, but there's also the bias of ignorance. And most people, frankly, in the world, uh, not just the United States, but most people in the world are financially illiterate. But when it comes to covering government, you know, I know, 90% of what government does is decide how we're going to spend our financial assets. Are we going to go to education, health care, roads and bridges, you know, law enforcement? It's not about gay marriage and gun control and all that. But the media, because they're financially illiterate, they can't follow the discussion of pensions and why the pensions are broken. They can't discuss discuss the issues of tax cuts or tax tax increases in an intelligent way. They don't know how the stock markets work. And the problem is if, you know, if you're a, a, a plumber or a baker and you're not dealing with these issues, maybe, you know, that's, that's not malpractice for you. But if you're a journalist and you don't know the difference between a stock and a bond, if you don't know what a bond is, how do you cover a school board? You can't. You know, I mean, and, and as I right. just said that, there's probably some journalists listening, well, what has that got to do with the school board? I mean, it's just, so what they don't know, and, and I don't even blame the individual journalists necessarily. I mean, I do to some extent. We're all responsible. They could pick up a book on how the economy works. But I went, I have a master's degree in journalism and not in, and not one Never did I have a class on how the economy works or how anything that would have made us financially literate. I just learned it on my own from running mm -hmm. businesses and investing in the stock market and buying real estate. But folks, it's important. And so the bias in the media, and you're right, is not just that you know they're liberal and they don't cover fairly conservatives. There is that. But there's so much of what they don't see uh, when it comes to deciding what are we going to put on the television screen? What are we going to put on the radio? What are we going to put in the newspaper? Because they just don't get so many issues. And now we come, yes. go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. 
Well, no, I just wanted to interrupt here. I mean, that said, there are some media that do a great job. I mean, I think you do a great job. I love your long form interviews. A lot of times uh, the, the local media is too um, short with their stuff. Uh, many times they don't even, they don't know the subject well enough to even ask the right questions or to challenge the, the what's being told them by whoever it might be, a bureaucrat, a politician, you, you don't know. Uh, an activist, for example, they don't even know to, what questions to ask of these people, which is a problem. But I do want to point out one particular thing. So, and then sometimes they report very late. So on April 5th, the Chicago Tribune did a great article on the Smart Buy program, which was a the, the Illinois student loan bailout program. That's what I call it. It was $25 million that was slipped into the $45 billion infrastructure plan passed in 2019. And so now, literally two years later, um, after the program had been in place for about six months, it had started in December of 2020. Um, so after about six months of it being in process, but two years be after it had passed the legislature, uh, they write the first article about it. Well, nobody knew about this ahead of time. And I honestly think if people knew at the time that they were passing this massive piece of legislation, that there was a bailout for student loans in a bankrupt state like Illinois, I think that you, that would have been pulled out. And so the media has got to be, you know, through no fault of their own, because honestly, I talked to Republicans and they didn't know about the Smart Buy program. So nobody knew about it. I bet you rank and file Democrats didn't know about it. But you know who did know about it? Governor Pritzker knew about it. DCEO knew about it. The housing people knew about it. Uh, so there are plenty of people who did know about it. And, um, you know, and, and and but you just get all these budget documents so late, you can't even just decipher it. But but I had wish that the media would be more proactive in ferreting out this information earlier. I well, know it's hard, I, I, I would also <laughs> say, uh, um, I'm just trying to edit my <laughs> my comments for brevity. But you know, one of the real uh, the way Illinois operates is not the same as every other state. This state, the corruption here is. I mean, sometimes there's overt corruption, you know, pay me under the table kind of corruption. But there's other times there's so much corruption here just in the way the Illinois legislation process works. And mm -hmm. we saw that we just had a vote on a 40, I believe, 42.3 billion dollar. I mean, you know, well, that's chump change, right? It's not like 42.3 billion dollars is a lot of money. I mean... It, this is ridiculous. I mean, the bill to fund the state came to the state legislature with about 30 minutes left before the close of the session. And, yeah. and we had one person on the Republican side who had time to ask a couple of questions on yeah. short debate because the Democratic majority wanted to ram this through with no one being the wiser about what the hell was in the bill. Uh, right. I mean, and Republicans didn't get even a look at the de any detail at all until seven hours prior to the vote. And then the vote was taken four minutes before midnight <laughs> on Memorial Day. I mean, look, well, I, I had mean, a Democratic friend, not a, a non- Apparently the voters don't Go ahead. care, though. Whoops. Whoops. Sorry, I flung my phone off. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but apparently the voters don't care. I don't know. Well, this is the thing. I, I had a Democratic friend, on, I mean, not an office holder, but someone who's, a, you know, is a Democrat from Chicago. Well, Terry, that's, uh, they've debated this for months, this spending. Now, well, first of all, even if they have, it's been in committee that they've talked about it. That's number one. And if I'm on the transportation committee, I don't know what you're putting in for education. I don't know what you're putting in for health care. And number two, I don't know that you're not saying, um, well, we're going to slip in something that is going to give a whole bunch of money to some project you know, like, I don't know, like the Nazi party of Illinois. Let's give them a hundred million dollars. How do I know that's in the bill if you throw a thousand page bill on my desk 
with well, again, 15 minutes is, to read it. Yeah. This is the other problem. The media just accepts it. They don't, uh, you know, they don't complain about it enough, in my opinion. And in this case, uh, the fact that the Democrat state reps, Democrats, got a, a got uh, you know a billion dollars in infrastructure money that came from the federal government ARPA funds. They got a billion dollars for only the Democrat state districts. No Republicans got this money and the Democrats can divvy up that money to whoever they want to. And it's your tax dollars. So if you are represented by a, a, a Republican, you're getting none of that largesse into your district. I mean, how do they get away with this? I, 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 suburban mothers well, and, and this for is, Democrats. How do you hand, how do you uh, think that this is fair? It's not going to your school. It's not going to your park district. It's not, none of this money is getting to your disability groups. They're getting nothing. Only the Democrats. And you think that's fair? And you're going to vote these guys. You're going to vote Tara Costa Howard back into office uh, and Stava Murray back into office. Janet Yang Rohr. Well, and, and the point, you're making the point that, that I would, be, here's where, again, being critical of the media, it's just what you said. Why isn't this driven home on every media outlet? That this is no way to run a democracy. And that yeah. Illinois, it's time for Illinois to accept democracy and to quit having our legislature and 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 the state of Illinois government structure run like it's a mafia operation. And this is happening once again this week. Folks, if you have the lights on in your house, if you like to have an electric bill that may be $80 a month instead of an electric bill that's going to be $300 or $400 a month, then you better pay attention to what we're about to say because once again, here we go, that the Illinois legislature is going to vote on a bill this week, a green energy bill that is going to change massively how we have the electric grid, where the electricity comes from, the, the legislature want to force a green energy so that they, as I said with Tim Butler the other day, they can sit there and wave their flag. Look at how green we are. We're going to save the planet. They're, they're virtue signaling, and yet what they're going to do is say, we have to buy so much power from wind and solar, and mm -hmm. the technology Wind and solar right now, as Tim Butler told us, uh, State Representative Tim Butler told us the other day, wind and solar combined make up about 7% of where we get our electricity. And neither one of those are are all what we call baseload power. They're not always on. Yeah. Uh, Jeannie, and yet, you know, when we talked to Tim Butler, uh, Jeannie and I are recording this on Sunday, June the 13th. Mm -hmm. I talked to Tim on the 12th or uh, on Friday, I think that was what, the 11th, I guess. 11th. So, mm -hmm. um, but Tim Butler on Friday had no, had never seen the bill. And yet, like like with no. the uh, budget, they're going to drop this, you know, at the last minute. And everyone in the legislature who doesn't understand these issues, who probably, I'm going to guess 90% of them don't even know what the term baseload energy means, Oh, they don't have any idea. No, you know, no. they're going to vote on this uh, and, and they can all become uh, electric uh, experts on electricity and they can vote for green energy. And, and guess what, folks, it means it means that your electric bill, when th when they pull the plug on coal fired power plants and coal fired power plants are what keep your electric bill reasonable, you, you know, wind and solar is not cheap. Yeah, no, let's let's be clear here. So right now in the state of Illinois, we get about uh, the 54% of our uh, elect, uh, power coming into your home, your commercial in, uh, industry, whatever it is, from nuclear. So 54% nuclear, about 24% coal, about 20% is, um, is gas, all right? And then you've got that 7% that's basically wind and solar. And I'm not quite sure, but I believe that some of that may be wind credits that we purchase from Iowa, not wind that we actually 
produce in the state of Illinois. So there's there's all these nuances to that as well. But regardless, you know, wind and solar make a very small fraction of it. Now, going back well over a decade, this, the Illinois General Assembly set out a goal that we were going to be 25% renewable by 2025. Well, that, that is only four years away and we're at 7% according to state rep, Tim Butler. How are we gonna get to 25% in four years? We're not, that's the truth. We're not going to get there. Yet in this new energy legislation that is being looked at on Tuesday in the Illinois State Senate and on Wednesday in the Illinois State House and, and going to go for a vote, by the way, this will be voted on this week. They have done all the backroom maneuvering to get this deal done. They brought in all the special interest groups to screw over the taxpayers and the ratepayers at the same time. And in some cases, it's both the you're both the taxpayer and the ratepayer. Um, but in, in any case, um, when they're doing this, uh, th th their goal in there is to be 40% renewable by 2030. That's nine years away and we're at 7%. There's no way additionally they have decided that in this bill, they say we're going to get rid of all coal production by 2035 and all natural gas production in the state by 2045. This is a the biggest lie told to any suburban housewife ever or any mother, period. And Jeannie, let me Listen. just bring up uh, I, uh, for people. Uh, now this is a bit dated and, and you, the numbers okay. you're, you're saying may, may, I mean, this is 2016. Okay, but it yes. more or less shows the thing. Bit. The thing, mm -hmm. if you look in there, try to find where it says solar on there. You're not going to see it. It's that little sliver of other, 0. 0.7. Uh, you, you see, wind is 5.7. So again, wind and solar are only 7%, uh, according to uh, Representative Butler, as he said the other day, and he's more up to speed as far as what the current. But this illustrates that if you get rid of that you know, maroon version that's coal and you get rid of natural gas we're moving from coal to natural gas but those are both fossil fuels and the greens right. don't want that the environmentalists don't want that so you're going to get yeah. rid of approximately 42 percent and by the way the environmentalists are, uh, are not really keen on nuclear either which is the big gold you know the 50 plus right. percent but if you get rid of coal and natural gas you're getting rid of 42%. How are you gonna make that up? And as Representative uh, Butler they has can't. said to us uh, the other day, when you have a, a lack of energy for wind and solar, there's no way 7% can be replacing 42%. Representative Butler said, you're gonna go out on the spot market and that's buy right. electricity that's, right. that's made from coal in other states. So what are you even oh, yeah. achieving? You're, you're, the only thing you're achieving is not one doggone thing as far as helping the planet, as far as reducing the carbon footprint. You're not achieving that. What you are going to achieve is you're going to raise electrical rates on retirees. You're going to have union people who are working at coal-fired plants or, and, and dig coal miners. You're going to have them losing their jobs. And... Where are we in discussing this as a society? Why are we having this vote next week? Instead of, you know, at least to their credit, I'll give, Andy Menar and, and Martin I'll Sandoval went around the state yeah. and talked about transportation. I don't know that, how many people, if you went around the state, even know this is coming up for a vote. We're not doing anything to share the impact of what this will be. And this is the part that's shameful, and I don't say this in a partisan fashion, but I'm not here to be nonpartisan about good government and bad government. This is bad government. Well, listen, the reason it's coming up for a vote is because Exelon is pushing them into an energy package to bail out two additional nuclear plants. So in 2016, December of 2016, we bailed out two plants that they say were not profitable for them and they were going to shut down, losing thereby really good paying jobs. And so we bailed them out with $2.4 billion over 10 years hiking rates on, on, on consumers. Okay, so now they're back five years later saying, oh my gosh, well really they've been, they've been asking for this for over a year now. So really f um, four years later, after they got the first bailout, they're now saying, oh, two more nuclear plants need to be bailed out. 
And that's why the that's why the push for this entire energy packet, because you have to bring you, if you want to bring in a bailout for nuclear again, then you're going to have to buy off some legislators for other things that they may want. And so they're going to the green legislators and they're buying them out, saying we're going to get rid of coal, all coal generation by 2035 in the state, all gas generation by 2045. The truth is you're not going to if you get rid of that generation, which I honestly don't think they're going to do because the consumer prices would be outrageous and and you could and the market you can't replace that in any way in Illinois so you're just going to be importing it from other states like Tim Butler said which will spike prices um, but here's the deal this you know I'm sorry I'm not giving up my gas dryer I'm not giving up my gas it cooks top I'm not giving up my gas furnace and nobody else in the state of Illinois is either. So just because you shut down production in the state of Illinois doesn't mean we're not going to still have gas coming into our homes. So these guys are crazy. These Democrats are morons when it comes to policy. This policy is terrible. We are an energy rich state in coal and in natural gas and in oil. And we have a lot of nuclear plants. But you know what we're, what we're doing? We're not building more nuclear to replace coal and gas. We're, we're trying to salvage whatever nuclear we can with a bailout to Exelon, parent company of ComEd, caught doing dirty deals with Madigan and company, allegedly. Let me add the allegedly in. But obviously, there's people that have already been indicted for, for this type of um, uh, deal making that's unethical. And, uh, and, and so Exelon's being the heavy in here, and they are trying to still get another bailout, even though they're in trouble. So, But it gets worse. This bill is even worse than that. If you shut down the Prairie State uh, Coal Campus, if you shut that down, there are long-term contracts with many municipalities in the state of Illinois and about eight other states because the coal is produced and extracted right there on the Prairie State Coal Campus. And then, it, that, and then the, the plant produces the electricity and then it is shipped to various places uh, along the grid and uh, people have made long-term contracts. One of those people with long-term contracts is the city of Naperville, also Winneka, also Batavia, also St. Charles, up here in the suburbs. Well, they have long-time bond contracts. If you shut down Prairie State, if you shut down Prairie State, who's paying off of those bonds? Well, in this deal, in this deal, and I have some of the details in front of me, I'm telling you right now, taxpayers and ratepayers are going to bail out long-term contracts that we had no part of doing it with it because our cities didn't take that stupid deal. One thing that uh, people can get lost in this, I know. And yes, so I want to kind of keep it um, as clear as possible. What people should know, including the lawmakers, is when we have the electric grid when we go into our house and we flip the switch as americans we take it for granted the electricity will be there that the light will come on and the other thing i would say is all of us as americans realize that we live a more sumptuous lifestyle than people in other parts of the world generally speaking i mean People might live okay in Canada and, you know, so, but the reason we have the sumptuous American lifestyle, I would argue, is because throughout our history, we have had cheap energy. Yeah. And that means that we can not only have mom and dad have a car, but Junior and Sally get to have a car. That we can keep the lights burning in the house, that we can have the kids be on the computer game because they're not paying $10 an hour for electricity. Electricity yes, is so cheap, we take should. it for granted. But the liberals think you should, but it gets even worse than that. I mean, I love how Chris Wright of Liberty Energy did that entire expose of North Face, who, uh, and, and said, look, you know, 90% of your product, it comes from the oil and gas field. So how dare you try to say that you're not gonna work with the oil and gas field and logo some jackets for, uh, for one of the uh, energy companies. I mean. But people don't know where people where this comes from. It's even more than that. I mean, I was talking with somebody else, and they essentially said, "Look, the syringes that are used to inject people with the COVID nineteen vaccine, where does that plastic come from? It's an oil and gas product. I mean, it, it, you cannot get away from it. Our, our 
we are so much better off for these fuels that are extracted and used in many different ways that people don't even realize. And I, I just, I, I wish we need to get to sensible policy, realistic policy. And what they're doing is they're mocking you. They're saying that they're going to go green. They, it's impossible to do so. It's not going to happen. So they're lying to you while virtue signaling. And if their policies were to go into play, you would literally have rolling black outs like California has um, has seen throughout the years. Yeah, I, I think people are under the impression that, well, yeah, uh, you know, coal is dirty and, and the fossil fuels are hurting the environment. So let's just replace wind and solar with, you know, with uh, all these dirty fossil fuels. That's the kind of way it's presented to us, as if there will be no other implications, as if we can have that clean energy replace fossil fuels, as if we can have that replaced for the same price. And let's just take a look to here. This is U.S. energy consumption 2018. But again, oil is a fossil fuel. And it's 36.5%, followed by natural gas, a fossil fuel with 30.5%. Uh, so right there, you're at like 67%. <laughs> then you add in coal, a fossil fuel. So you go from 67% to 80%. When you look at, then you got hydro, but when you look at wind is two and a half, solar is less than one. Folks, we cannot be replacing fossil fuels with so-called green energy, the wind and solar, and continue to have the American lifestyle that we want. Now, that was in the US. It's, the difference is that we have a lot more nuclear uh, in, in, in Illinois. Illinois, as we've discussed here before. But that said, if they decide that they're going to close down these nuclear or these uh, coal-fired plants, one is right here in Springfield, CWLP, which is City Water, Light, and Power, and the other is uh, a little further south of here. Uh, mm -hmm. This this impacts yeah. the entire state. It's not just that they are in this area, but it impacts yeah. the state. And then lastly... How do you people who are working on, on on hoping that there's a good, viable Illinois economy where people are going to be paying their property taxes to fund your pensions, how do you imagine that's going to happen if we destroy the Illinois economy and if we can no longer attract one business to come here because the cost of energy is going to double? I mean, right now, uh, that, our energy... That, yeah, that's why I say they're liars, because this is not going to happen, because they can't let it happen. They're just virtue signaling, which is even worse, because they're just a bunch of liars. I mean, again, this this is unrealistic. It will not happen. They will, you know, extend the deadlines on all of this stuff while virtue signaling this year, simply to get to build a big enough coalition to get 71 votes in the House, and I think it's 36 votes in the Senate to get to to pass a bill to bail out Exelon that had uh, you know nearly two billion dollars in profitable profitability in 2019. Uh, yet we're going to bail them out those corrupt sons of bitches, honestly. Um, uh, you know, uh, and I just, I don't understand it at all. Look, I'm pro nuclear. I'm not pro nuclear bailout. Yeah, you know, I mean, to me, and other people have said this, I, I look, I think there's a legitimate argument to make against nuclear as far as what do you do with the waste. But when I was with C-SPAN, and that was back in when Bill Clinton was still in his first term, uh, the idea is that we are going to put nuclear waste around the country into Yucca Mountain, which is in Nevada. And that was in 1994, 1995, when I was covering the U.S. Senate, they were debating this. And you were going to bury this like a mile deep because this stuff stays radioactive for like 2,000 years. Uh, Harry Reid, the senator who became the majority leader from Nevada, kept that from happening. And here we are 30 years later, virtually, and we still don't have Yucca Mountain. So... That's a legitimate issue, but if you want to say, I, if you want to be a green energy that's baseload, 
Baseload meaning it's the power production is 24 hours a day. 24-7, yeah. 24-7, uh, which wind isn't, and obviously the sun doesn't shine at night. And again, this is a key thing. I don't know if I said this, I meant to say it, that I think we, that there's no way to store electrical power in massive quantities. When you have a steel mills, we have an Alton, uh, you're mm -hmm. keeping steel melted 24 hours a day. Yeah. So you can pour yeah. steel and form, you know, the all the stuff that we use steel for. You can't do that on a solar panel. You can't do that on a windmill. And we've we've made as a state this initial initial entry into these alternative energy sources. Uh, and we're only at 7%. So folks, I mean, are you going to do without 93% of your energy? And uh, the only thing I could say if I were arguing on the other side, and again, I, I, Jeannie, what, when are they going to say we can't use coal or we have to, because I haven't been able to read uh, no the bill. Coal, yeah, no more coal at 2035. However, how are you going to get to 40% renewables by 2030? nine years away so they actually want to get rid of it more i mean progressively more and they more. have to get to how much how, let's say that again how much by 2030 we got to be how much renewables 40 percent 40 percent there's seven percent now yes there's, there's so no how are you going to do that you know for to to, to replace uh you know a mid-sized coal plant takes about 600 square miles of of land uh full of windmills all right uh, well, that's about the size of DuPage County for one mid-sized coal plant. That is just not going to happen. It's it's unrealistic. It ha can't happen. The technology is not sophisticated enough. You can't store it. So, uh, and I encourage encourage everybody to actually watch Michael Moore's movie, The Planet Human, where he essentially outs green energy for really not being green. It's not green. Um, and just because it's important to me, I'm going to get my lick in here again. Um, and the big Biden infrastructure plan that is a SOP to green en energy as well. Uh, you know, they have lots of subsidies in there for biomass. Biomass is terrible. And, um, and um, uh, Michael Moore in his movie, Planet Human, exposes exactly what biomass is all about. It's uh, terrible. And in fact, it gives off one and a half times the amount of CO2 as coal does. And who is personally invested in biomass? Congressman Sean Caston right here in the Illinois 6th District, right in the suburbs. He's personally invested in biomass. And of course, votes for the Biden bill is all in for it. And he's going to be personally benefited by these massive subsidies. And he has I, no I'd be wrong if I that. don't mention that you ran against Sean Castor for Congress. Yes, so I did run against uh, it's him. It's not like we want to hide that. Uh, but no, uh -uh. but uh, again, folks, uh, what I would say is if I was going to argue the green side, uh, they might say, well, Terry, you're acting as if we're going to close these coal plants down tomorrow and we're, we're going to be closing them down in the future. So we're going to have a period of transition. But as Jeannie Ives just said, uh, how are you going to go from 7% to 40%? In again, what what was the year, Jeannie? I know I almost have to write this. By twenty thirty. By twenty thirty, and that's like eight years world. from now. Yeah, ex exactly. And if you're going to get that way, the easiest thing for them would to be to shut down all coal, which is twenty four percent of our mix. Well, so now if you're at seven percent and you expand wind some, okay, so you're going to shut down all coal by twenty thirty. And let's not uh, let's not uh, no as as. No I mean, there you go again. I mean, come on, folks. How are you going to replace the coal and the natural gas? Uh, those are fossil fuels. And as Tim Butler said, uh, he was in a hearing the other day with, um, or, or a while back, with a Democratic lawmaker who was saying they want uh, wind uh, hey, Terry, mills I lost you. in Lake Michigan to be three miles away. And he goes, why is that? And he goes, well, you know, they're visually pollute. We don't want the visual pollution. Terry? But we can put them all over the central Illinois and corn and have the sound of the, you know, the, I mean, folks, it, these things are, 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 first of all, just on a cost factor. Uh, well, on a practical basis, you can't replace 
wind and solar and not base load. They're not going to keep the lights burning. If, if we go to that, we had we have seen the future in California where they have brownouts, where their grid can't support the electrical mm -hmm. demand. Uh, the other thing I would say is... And when they do have those brownouts, what they do is they then tend to import 20% of their energy out from outside of the state, and that is coal-produced energy. Uh, you can read about it. Any, everybody who has been you know, looking at any of this information ever, they know that California had to import 20% of its energy during the black, uh, brownouts and blackouts uh, from other states, and it was coal-produced. Liars. You, They're all liars. You know, the other thing, and I, this, is, this is not being melodramatic, but this, this is a heat wave, is a book. It's written about the heat wave of 1995 in uh, Illinois. And guess what happened? 700, 700 people in Chicago in July 1995 died from the heat. Now, those were not people who could afford air conditioning. When, when you impact and take mm -hmm. away the low cost fossil fuels and replace them with higher cost wind and solar, and you drive electrical rates up, how many other people are not going to be able to afford in the future a future heat wave? How many others are not going to be able to afford to run their air conditioning? And I've mentioned this the other day, and you can folks go on YouTube and look at 60 Minutes Australia. Australia, which like Illinois, has plenty of coal, and mm -hmm. Australia, which passed a green energy bill, and all of a sudden their electrical rates shot up sky high so that retirees could no longer afford to cook every night. They, they interviewed a couple that cooked one day a week and then left leftovers because they couldn't afford to turn their electric stove on anymore. We don't mean that this is going to go where your electric bill goes up by $10 a month or where your electric bill goes up by $20 a month. This is taking an $80 or $85 electric bill a month and it goes to $300 or $400 a month. I mean, because you're going to replace, yeah. I just to, again, when you take away 40 something percent of the electrical power production and replace it or attempt to replace it with power that is more expensive, that has implications. Well, it all has implications. I mean, and, and we're just talking about some of this. I mean, the truth is if you have to import uh, electricity from other states, uh, you're also that means more transmission line production as well you're interfering with people's property rights when you put in those new lines i mean there's a huge brouhaha about uh one of the new transmission lines they want to put in right through a farmer's farm fields literally i mean we don't think about the externalities of, of building out the grid um here in the suburbs because it's so tight uh, but downstate, there's real externalities to having to build out the grid as well to even support wind and solar and when you do that, you know, uh, a farmer who was able to, you know, put in 36 rows because he has a combine that big now has to buy a whole new equipment because that windmill is in the way or that transmission line stand is in the way. I mean, it, it, come on. Uh, and this is stuff is this is stuff that it does not need to be done. We're, we're an energy rich state and uh, we should keep it that way. We should use the power that we have. Jeannie, let me ask you as a former House member. Um, yes. You know, I mean, these people, and I'm not saying I'm not saying the people of the legislature are stupid, but we can't all be experts at something, and these issues are involved. And if you have, I I know this from having covered it for years, mm -hmm. and being schooled in it. I didn't know any. I didn't know what baseload energy meant before. I had to be schooled no. on this. And again, my my criticism is that we're, we're not doing something that impacts, you know, one county in the state. We're, we're talking about a bill that's going to impact the entire state and then asking lawmakers to vote mm -hmm. on this major piece of legislation when they haven't been schooled on the ramifications. And so what, I mean, what There's do you think? Or is, am I right no, on this? this? this How is, many people this know this, deal. would you say? This is a greased deal. This is special interest deals. This is people like Ann Williams sitting up in freaking Chicago who will never see a windmill in her 
uh, outside of her window. She will never see a solar field outside of her window, imposing all sorts of requirements on the rest of the state because she's, you know, she's doesn't even, she has no kids, she has, you know, no family, she takes care of herself, that's it. And she can afford more, higher energy, I guess, but she is the queen of green energy in Springfield. And she doesn't care. She does not care how this impacts families. She only cares about her ideological bent on green energy. It's just crap. And so they are putting together a deal with Republicans who represent nuclear energy um, facilities in their districts who want to, you know, who are being pressured because of jobs and whatever else to bail out Exelon again, massive $2 billion profitable company, um, you know, to bail them out. They're getting pressured to do that. And they're putting together just enough votes between the greenies and the people with the nuclear facilities. And then all these other folks who, who uh, say that they, that, you know, that they, that, oh, they got some low income stuff in here too. Like, look, if you're low income and you're getting low income yeah, heating assistance, utility assistance from the state of Illinois, guess what? Uh, you don't ever have to worry about a late payment again or a, down, or a down payment to even get started on electricity. Oh, we're just gonna write that off. I mean, so you've got, you've got little pieces in here um, to, to pull just enough legislators together to vote for this thing. And it is a garbage bill from top to bottom. Garbage bill. And when we don't know what's in and, it. And that's what they're doing. We don't know what's in it. I, is there, no, is there I mean, something in there, by the way, that says we should abolish fossil fuel cars? Well, they, uh, there is something here that's saying that I'm going to, and you, Terry, and all of their taxpayers are now going to provide a $4,000 tax credit to people who purchase an electrical vehicle. And by the way... I'm sorry, I do not want to help out the Tesla drivers. Well, do not care. here's something that, that people ought to think about. Where is the electricity going to come from <laughs> for your electric vehicle? I, I mean, you know, it's like, have you stopped to think that your electric Tesla is being fueled by coal and, uh, and, and the nuclear power? If you do away with fossil fuels, you're not going to have enough electric energy in the grid. And what will happen, as Tim Butler has pointed out, is you're going to go out and bite in the spot market. <laughs> Kentucky runs 80 percent on coal. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. As we, you know, uh, we brought up before the uh, consumption in the United States that uh, fossil fuels makes up like 80 percent of the energy pie in the United States. So, Jeannie, mm -hmm. I mean, the well, question I meant yeah, to ask before, on on. do you I think just, I, do you think, think lawmakers understand what they're voting on uh, in your estimation? Um. I, I think the lawmakers who are going to vote understand why they're vote they're going to vote on this one way or the other. I think they do, and but I don't think that they know. I I, I don't think I think many of them have no idea about what this means long term for the state. I think they're short sighted. I think they they uh, see their own little niche that they are going to shop to their district, and honestly, this is really detrimental policy. My so people need to be aware. I hope that they listen to your interview here. I hope that they talk to their state senator. I hope they encourage them to vote no. Nobody in the suburbs should be voting for this, and none of these state legislators should be voting for this. This is such a garbage bill all around. You know, my attitude about democracy is if we say, uh, and I'm going to make an extreme example here for the purpose of illustration, but if we debate that we should uh, use a chainsaw to cut off people's left arms so that everyone writes with their right hand, and we all understand the implications and we agree to do that, well then, okay, you decided in a democratic process that this is what we wanted. What I have a problem with is when we don't discuss issues, when we slip things through, when we try to have a minority of people focused on something and use uh, fraudulent democracy, which is what you have when you don't put a bill out there to be considered the weekend before you're going to have the vote, you still don't have it out there. When the population mm -hmm. has not heard about this, when the news media hasn't had a chance to focus on this or, or be brought up to speed on this, this is not democracy. I mean, this is democracy no. in name only. No. And, and it's, uh, so what should people do if we captured their attention, 
what would your your recommendation? I think you just made it, but let's just repeat it for folks. What would you say between now and Tuesday? What do Illinois voters have the option to do to maybe uh, say, wait a minute? Well, they, they need to call. This needs to go through the Senate and the House. Neither House has voted on it. So call your state senator, call your state rep, tell them that you oppose the energy bailout bill. You oppose um, the, you know, you want more details, not less. You don't appreciate them um, coming in with a massive, uh, you know, it's like 900 pages in, of legislation. It is out there. It is. It's the proposals out there. Uh, it is but it's very difficult to read. Not a lay person can read it. And so they should ask, they should ask, look, I got all the details. I have all the details that's in this bill. I got it from people down there, but you can find it online as well. Um, maybe I'll post on my website, uh, but they should ask for the details, be able to read it themselves. And if they don't understand something, they should inform themselves. But honestly, they they need to just, this, this is, should be a big no. I don't want to bail out Naperville's bad contract with Prairie State. I don't. I want to keep my gas drier at an affordable cost going, um, and I don't want to bail out Exelon again. Um, even though I am pro nuclear power, um, I think that there's that, 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 that this is a bailout for them. Um, so uh, that's what I would tell them. I'd contact your legislator. All right, Jeannie Eyes, I'm sure we could, as I said earlier, we could talk for hours on this. We already went uh -huh. much longer than I uh, expected to have you on here. As always, you're interesting, you're informed, and we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. And, uh, you know, hopefully this has uh, helped people out there who watch this. Uh, and folks, one last thing I would say, if you're watching this, there's a whole lot of us in the state of Illinois who aren't. So share the video if you wish so that others can hear about it because obviously a whole lot of people in the news media have not focused on this or to the extent that they have and again i'll be critical uh, they take something like this and Jeannie, you've been on some of the pbs stations without picking on any one particular they have four different lawmakers and they give you six minutes to talk about an issue yes. and you and i have just gone you know, close to 55 minutes, just just the two of us. So, you know, mm -hmm. doing six minutes with four people or eight minutes with four people is not covering an issue. In any event, Ginny yeah. Eiswood, thank you for taking so much time on a Sunday afternoon to be with us. We appreciate it. Uh, always a pleasure to be on with you, Terry, because it, it's always an informative interview. You know your stuff. Thank you. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks for watching, okay. and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.